mean, the pattern that we mentioned and we've been discussing now, the pattern of UK uh, investment, for instance, if I think of Nigeria and parts of Africa, I think maintains that colonial pattern because it's very focused on minerals. For some of the reasons that have been mentioned here, it's easier. Um, your profit margins are larger. So it makes more sense to do that. And then the narratives we're hearing also about the sort of post-Brexit uh, um, engagement is, you know, we have a special relationship. You know, we have something in place already. Um, let's continue to work with that. So if we're thinking of it in that way, I think, yes, we can make that argument. If we think of the impact also, that's all, I, I like this point about you know, making yourself attractive, making yourself ready. But the reason why countries are not attractive and ready are linked also to that colonial experience. They didn't just appear not ready or, you know, not suitable. A lot of that is linked to that. Why is South Africa ready? Why is South Africa very attractive? Because of its apartheid history. Because it's a situation where you have been able to exploit the majority for a minority and put in place the kind of infrastructure that is today very attractive. You know, so we have to deal with a lot of those realities. You know, why, why can't you look the way you have to look? There are reasons to it. Those countries are not here, even when you think of the conflict in many of Sierra Leone's conflict is linked also to its colonial history. That is partly why it cannot present itself in, a, or, you know, in, in some regards it is. And nowadays it's trying to clean up the conversations with the Kimberley um, initiative and all of that. But a lot of those problems are very much linked to that colonial experience. Now, if we come, I mean, there's been a lot of reference to what is going on with China as well, and one can, and there are debates uh, around the extent to which there is a path dependency. So here we have a somewhat a semi-periphery context, um, and we have to complicate that global north, global south narrative because we have China um, on the stage now, and sometimes we are seeing a relationship that mirrors that conversation about the you know the, the west, the global north, however you want to term it, and economies at the moment. Um, so we you know. I think there, there's much to be said around that. It is true. You do see investments that come in. The extent to which you're thinking about technology transfer has been criticized. That you're, don't, you're not seeing that exchange. The sort of the importation of capital, the importation of labor, um, you know, so that it, there's very little technology retained in that context. However, the flip side, I think, of, of this debate and this argument, Stefan has also referenced the Ethiopia uh, situation. I've also worked on Ethiopia, looking at Chinese investment in um, in the leather industry, and you know my own research findings were that you did see certain degrees of technology transfer. You did see you know certain improvements, knowledge transfer that meant um, uh, you know you, you you had better access to the inputs you needed or required. There was an expansion in production, expansion in exports as well. So all of those things that you want to see, and for Ethiopia. That investment is very important because of the savings gap. Ethiopia doesn't have the sort of mineral resources that other economies have. But what you did see also in that situation was a neglect of domestic producers, right? So all of this improvement was being dominated by these foreign investors. And you have a very vibrant leather industry um, in Ethiopia, but the uh, domestic producers were not benefiting from that. And there was a neglect even of that um, a local market where they were now importing Chinese footwear, for instance, instead of utilizing this newly produced, uh, th this um, expansion in production of, of leather goods. So it is a, a complex picture. Another final point on, on uh, the different, uh, what I see as a difference with China is the investment in infrastructure. And I would argue that for all the challenges and problems, and it's true, what Stefan has said about the, the costing around the Kenyan uh, rail, this has been very topical. You know, I'm Nigerian and I grew up, you know, in, in, in that context. And it is only now I'm seeing trains that are moving. You know, I have siblings who get on the train and go from one city to another. This sounds, I mean, to me, I, I look at it and I cannot believe that is my country. And there are a lot of, and don't, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of challenges with how a lot of those contracts have been negotiated, the elites that are benefiting from that arrangement. But there are trains that are working and moving, and people can live in another city and go and work in another city. You know, if, you know, if anyone has been in Lagos traffic, you will appreciate uh, uh, you know, the benefit of this sort of infrastructural investment. The investments in energy, hydroelectric dams, and this move by China is challenging Europeans and um, uh, Americans in how they think about investment in Africa. Infrastructure used to be a sort of 
no, no, who's going to do that? It costs too much, you can't afford it. But the narrative on that has changed as well. Thank you. Um, can I disagree about something? Please. That would be just thing. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry if it's, but uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I'll give you lots of time to you. But so I just want on, on, on quickly on three things there, one from things that you said. And, and the first one is the disagreement is on, you know, of course, colonialism and his, we, we cannot ever look at the present without recognizing history. But I just want to emphasize how the heterogeneity of experience again is it, how certain countries can do it. So there is no predestination. We should just be very careful with it. Vince mentioned already Botswana. Botswana is an interesting case. In that sense, it can actually overcome. Look, it is structures of economies and can worry about it, but it is definitely a much better functioning society that you will be happily maybe disagree with there on it. But but let's say compared to Nigeria, and I think I'm close to home for you, is, is there is there issues as well. So there is something there about can you learn to begin to overcome this? And I think that's what I, what we see more and more in African countries, is that some countries are consciously trying to overcome some of these structures. Because there's nothing against, across the world, not in natural resource investments in itself. Australia has lots of natural resource investments in itself. In fact, in Africa, of course, it's not Britain that's the biggest investor, it's actually Canada is, uh, is the biggest one uh, that, I, uh, that do this. And so you have economies that can do it. So you know, Indonesia was a country with lots of natural resources. But then it consciously made itself attractive for these other things. And so that's the bigger problem there. Actually, the other thing on the technology transfer, and, and it's really interesting that you say, because you know, I've worked a lot in Ethiopia as well, is that one of the things is often also with domestic industries, is that they actually struggle with scale. Yeah. And it's actually often managerial capabilities, not that they can be a good manager or not, but just how do you organize at scale for international markets? And this is actually one of the biggest benefits from, from FDI. So the technology is often managerial. And, and don't get me wrong, it's not because then Africans can't be good managers, but it's actually, it's a complicated thing to actually start running in very large, large scale. And it's not the technology transfer of the machine or whatever. And then the final thing on the infrastructure, I'm very tempted to say, let's hope the trains keep on running because we've had these phases with, with infrastructure investments. That is the, in, in time as well. But that's maybe where I would support you. And that's actually where it's a really interesting time. In the US, they now really have woken up that actually we need to make an offer. No, the best thing for Africa now is that everywhere wakes up, we also need to make these offers. A, a benign Africa, scramble for Africa. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just great for once, people want to try to do things. So. Uh, I, I just want to say yeah. a bit more about our favorite subject, which is Chinese investment in Africa, and just to draw on some of the conclusions of the work. Now, I think there's, there are big things happening, but they're very different things. The, first of all, there are the, what you might call the risk investors, the equity investors, real business people. And the, certainly the African capitals I've been to are absolutely buzzing with Chinese businessmen. And they are hustling, you know, and you don't get British businessmen hustling in Africa. They're given up. And Americans and most Europeans, they're no longer, they're, you know, particularly small, medium sized companies, they don't go anywhere near Africa. Very few of them. But so the Chinese have moved in. Actually, it has the, the Indians also. There are lots of Indian investment now. And these, these are the risk takers, um, and some of them are terrible, awful. You know, and they're, they're doing what he could describe. The, you know, some of them, they're, they're, their only role, they're wholesaling imports of local sh shoes and ruining local yeah. industries. But some of them are serious investors who are putting up factories and doing useful things and being very productive. And unlike Western companies, tend to have a very long time, time frame. Uh, you know, the Huawei's of the future, you know, I think in 20, 30 years ahead. So it's a very mixed story. But you've got to distinguish them, the real business people, from the banks. You know, the, 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 the big Chinese banks are lending vast amounts of money in Africa for these big infrastructure projects like the Kenya Railway, the Ethiopia Railway. And they're under a program which is actually promoted by the Chinese government. You know, it's a, President Xi's uh, signature policy, the BRI. And, you know, th th they, they are doing it, again, because the Western world has largely evacuated 
Africa in, in, in terms of infrastructure investment. It's very difficult to get, apart from the World Bank, um, one or two other institutions, it's very good, difficult to get uh, Western institutions to invest in physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's partly, you know, squeamishness, you know, not wanting it's to get involved in corruption. Too. <laughs> um, but but it, it is also we've, you know, people have walked away, and the Chinese are to some extent filling the gap. And some of those projects are good, as far as one can judge. Some of them are very uh, tacky, um, and they've adopted the practice of Western creditors of ensuring that they have proper collateral but, and, and, and that can be uh, very threatening you know, as you say the, the, Kenya, the, the, the Kenya government ceded as collateral for their railway uh, the port of Mombasa and Indeed. taking dues from the port of Mombasa. This is not the first example of, of that kind of collateral. No, no that kind of thing happened but the, you know, the, the, it goes back to the answer at the beginning supposing that those people were turned down and we said, well, they were just not going to accept this kind of conditionality. The, the, the alternative, of course, is that nothing happens. Um, and there's a really difficult choice here. You know, do you want um, bad investments, half bad investments, or no investments? And that's often, the, that's often the choice. Is that how you see the choice? I, I mean, wait, this is bringing us to... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.